Well, let's turn in our Bibles now to Romans chapter 13, verses 8 to 14. And I'm just going to read through the passage uh, as you read along with me, and then we'll get into our study together. Paul says in Romans 13, verse 8, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the opportunity that we have this morning to study it together and to hear from you. We give you praise and honor now and give us ears to hear what the Spirit would say to us in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you older folks remember what life was like when you were much younger? Most do. For many, it, it seemed like the possibilities were endless. Maybe you didn't know exactly what you wanted to do with your life, like me, but you knew you wanted to do something significant. You knew you wanted to be successful at whatever you decided to do. And when you figured out what it was, you gave it your all. But then age started creeping in. Middle age has passed, and you're getting close to the home stretch. You don't have the energy you once had. And instead of uh, worries becoming less and less, they seem to grow more along with fears and feelings you thought you'd never have. You begin to wonder if anything good will come going forward. But listen, folks, we are living in unprecedented times. I believe we are getting closer and closer to the culmination of all things. Time is running out. And sometimes when we see that, our tendency is to begin to slow down. But folks, now is no time to slow down. And that's true for all of us, not just the older among us. We're close to the finish line. And no one running a race slows down in the final stretch. It's really time to pour it on. And yet our culture tells us that when you get old, it's normal to slow down. As we prepare for retirement, we expect that our responsibilities will be less. And maybe so as far as our responsibilities to the things of this world are concerned, but not so as we serve the Lord. Whether young or old, God wants us to be all in. He wants us to be giving it our best as we serve him. Even more so as we consider the time as we know it is running out. So with time running out, how should we live? What should our priorities be? Our passage this morning, I think, gives us two main priorities with a few sub-priorities. First main priority is with time running out, we must love one another like never before. And that's in verses 8 to 10. And then the second main priority is with time running out, urgent times require urgent changes. We'll see that in verses 11 to 14. So our first main priority, with time running out, love others like never before. 
Now it seems like as we go through these epistles of Paul and Peter and John, we seem to talk a lot about our obligation to love others. This is a concept that is repeated over and over again in these letters. And because it is, we see that loving others is really part of our obligation to God. Look at verse 8. He says, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Now, Paul says to owe no one anything. The NIV says to let no debt remain outstanding. Many have taught that this means to not go into debt for anything. Pay for everything with cash. This is basically Dave Ramsey's approach, and honestly, I don't think it's a bad idea. After all, we read in uh, Proverbs 22, 7, the rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. The NIV is a little more dramatic in its choice of words in this passage. It says the borrower is slave to the lender. There can be no doubt that it's less cumbering to live without debt than with debt. To not have credit card debt or car uh, debt or even home debt makes us freer to do what we think the Lord is calling us to do than if we were in debt to all of these things. So it definitely is a good idea to be as free uh, from any kind of debt as we can be. I'm talking about financial debt. If I took a poll of all of us and asked, would you rather be in a lot of debt or in very little debt, I'm pretty sure that most of us would say we preferred the very little or the no debt option. I don't think Paul, uh, what Paul says here prohibits all financial debt, but it clearly prohibits debt that you can't pay back. In the Old Testament, the idea of borrowing from others was assumed and it was regulated, so it wasn't prohibited completely. But if you borrowed and you couldn't pay back, then things became very, very complicated for you. Life became very, very difficult. So if you can operate on a cash basis, that is no doubt a good thing. With larger purchases like cars and houses, you may have to borrow money, but don't borrow more than you can comfortably afford to pay back. And a good used car is always going to be more affordable than a new one. And a house that meets your needs as opposed to one that has everything that you could possibly ever want and more is probably going to be the better choice. In credit card debt, at the high rates they're charging is, is never a good idea. If you use a credit card, use it for convenience only, only and always pay the balance at the end of the month. And if you can't pay the balance at the end of the month, then you shouldn't buy what it is that you're contemplating buying. So that's my financial advice for today. At the same time, I don't think that is the main point of what Paul is saying here, actually. Uh, he's not trying to teach us about financial debt or no financial debt, although we might apply this statement to that. His main point is, if you're going to owe something to someone, owe them love and nothing but love. And that's especially true since time is running out and Jesus could be returning at any time. He's saying don't be encumbered by this world or the things of the world. Let your only encumbrance be to what God wants for you. And this is what God has called us to do and what we are obligated to do because of that. It's all over the New Testament. John 13, 34 says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. John 15, 17, Jesus said, These things I command you, that you love one another. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And then 1 Peter 1, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, 
love one another fervently with a pure heart. And then here's just one of John's many uh, exhortations and commands along these lines. 1 John 4.11 Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So there's two things here. There's one negative and one positive if we look at it the way Paul, I think, intended. Don't be in debt to anyone with just one exception. The one thing we should constantly owe everyone is love. And why is this? Because as he says in the last part of the verse, he who loves another has fulfilled the law. And this takes us back to Matthew 22, 35 to 40, where it says there, then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, that is Jesus, asked Jesus a question, testing him and saying, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So love God and love your neighbor, and you'll be fulfilling the law completely. And that's as true in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. And so Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 12, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Treat others as you would want to be treated, and you are loving them, and you're at the same time fulfilling the law. And don't just love the ones that are easy to love, like the ones who treat you right. Uh, loving those folks really takes no effort at all. Part of this debt of love we owe to others includes the many forgotten lives on the earth. Chuck Swindoll spoke about these folks in a recent devotion. He says that some are in prison, some are in hospitals, some are in nursing homes, some are homeless because of no fault of their own. Some might show up to church confused and afraid, hanging on to the end of a rope, ready to fall into oblivion. That's when someone who knows they have a debt to love all steps in and tries to help rebuild a life, restore a soul, restore a flame snuffed out by sin, giving that person a chance to sing again. It's what the writer of Hebrews was talking about when he said in Hebrews 13, 3, to cont continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Swindoll asks, can you put yourself into the pain of those who suffer? In other words, can you empathize, really empathize? Can you pause long enough to show the love of Christ to them? So we owe a debt of love to the forgotten lives in the world. But then we're also told that we need to love, of all people, our enemies. You say, well, I just don't know if I can do that. Well, it's true that as we get closer to the coming of Christ, it's becoming obvious that we Christians have a lot of enemies and not of our own making. They hate us just because we're Christians and because we live by the Bible. So how am I supposed to love them while they despise me? Hey, I didn't say it was easy. You know, as the old saying goes, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it, right? Well, probably not in this case. <laughs> how can we love those who hate us? Well, I would say the same way Paul did and the same way Jesus did. You remember what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 43 to 44, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And you remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 12, uh, verses 20 to 21. We just covered it a few weeks ago. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, 
but overcome evil with good. Again, this seems impossible. How can we do this? You mean to tell me that I need to have feelings of love for those who hate me and want to see me eliminated? And the answer to that specific question is a simple no. Nobody said anything at all about feelings of love. Then what does this mean? Well, this leads us to another consideration. Loving others is an action more than a feeling. And it partially fulfills our obligation to God. And to make this point, Paul tells us that. He says that love does no wrong to others. Look at verse 9. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love, he says, does no harm to a neighbor. So this first part of verse 9 is essentially saying that if you love someone, there are certain things you will never do to them. This is what I mean when I say that sometimes loving someone is a lack of certain actions toward them. And here Paul refers to five of the Ten Commandments. They're the five commandments expressed in the negative as they relate to the way we treat our fellow man. If we are really loving somebody, we won't be committing adultery against them. If we are really loving someone, we won't murder them. If we are really loving someone, we won't steal from them. If we are really loving someone, we won't lie about them or to them. Now, I realize the more modern translations don't have this one listed, but if you go back and you look at some of the oldest Greek uh, manuscripts available, it is in many of them, including the uh, oldest complete manuscript of the New Testament, Codex Sinaiticus. Uh, it was dated back in the 4th century, right around 350 A.D. And then the writings of the church father Origen, who lived and wrote in the 3rd century, around 240, 284 A.D. He mentions this, this part of the verse in his writings. But whatever you think about it, if you are really loving somebody, then you won't be lying about them or to them. And then the last one, if we are really loving someone, we won't be coveting what they have. Paul sums these up in the first part of verse 10 by saying, love does no harm to a neighbor. Then he talks about what love does do in the last part of verse 9. He says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's quoting from Leviticus 19.18. And if you want to know who your neighbor is, it's not just the family who lives next door or the family who lives on the same street as you do. Jesus answered this very specific question of who is my neighbor when he told the parable of the Good Samaritan in the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 to 37, to the, to the lawyer who was trying to justify himself. The man had been traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They beat him up, they stripped him of his clothes, and they left him half dead. A priest came by afterward and ignored him. A Levite came by after that and also ignored the man. Then a Samaritan, hated by the Jews generally, came by, took pity on this man, dressed his wounds, bandaged him up, and took him to an inn and took care of him there. And when he had to leave the next day, he gave the innkeeper some money and he asked him to take care of the man until he returned. And Jesus asked the lawyer, which of the three was a neighbor to the injured man, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan? And the answer, the one who had mercy on him, obviously the Samaritan. Jesus told him to go and do likewise. In other words, if you, want, if, if you would like to be helped in a situation like this, then you ought to be willing to help others when it's their turn. And as we do this, we realize 
as Paul says in the latter part of verse 10, that love fulfills the requirements of God's law. If you are truly loving others, then you, you, won't, you don't have to do a bunch of external things. You don't have to obey a bunch of external rules. Avoiding debt isn't the only thing we need to do to fulfill our obligation to God. Abstaining from wrongdoing isn't the only thing that we should be focused on. The living of our lives should be rooted in loving others. It's not just what we don't do, though that's part of it. It's what we do as well. And what we do is we love others. We love our friends and family, yes, but we also love those around us who need our help, our help. We love those who can't help themselves. And yes, we even love those who haven't asked for our help or who don't deserve our help or don't even want our help. And that includes our enemies. How do we love them? Well, not by forcing ourselves on them, obviously, but by refusing to treat them the way that they would treat us. And by praying for them to come to Christ and repent of their sins so that they might be forgiven and go to heaven. When we love others by refusing to do the things that Paul mentions here and by treating them the way that we would like to be treated, then we fulfill God's law and we are pleasing God. We please God because we're living the life of faith. Faith that trusts God to do what's right in our lives and in the lives of others. Time is running out, folks. And so with time running out, we need to love others like never before. That's our first point. And that leads us, obviously, to our second main point. With time running out, urgent times require urgent changes. We'll see this in 11 to 14. The first consideration under this point is that we must wake up to our eternal salvation being nearer than it's ever been. Look at verse 11. He says, and do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. And then he says, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Now, with verse 11, I like the way the New Living Translation renders this. And I realize this is what the theologians and the translators call a dynamic equivalent translation. That means it's not a word-for-word -word translation, but a translation that takes the words and renders them in the words that we would use today if we would want to say the same thing today, making the same point. In other words, some of the actual words may change, but the meaning and the point does not. Here it is in the New Living Translation. Romans 13, 11. This is all the more urgent, for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. And of course, this is where I got the title for the message today, living while time is running out. It says, time is running out. Now, what does he mean? He means we haven't got much time left before we experience the fullness of our salvation. And he says, it's time to wake up. It's really a very serious appeal. It's not just a wake up, it's time to get ready to go to church or to go to school or to go to work. It's more like, wake up, the house is burning down and we need to run like never before. It's like the athlete running the marathon. He's getting to the finish line and there are several other opponents that are close behind him. He doesn't slow down as he rounds the final stretch. He digs deep deep, deep, to muster every last bit of strength that he has left so that he can reach the finish line before his opponents. 
He's been pacing himself up to this point. But it's time now to really, really pour it on. Paul likens the Christian life to running a race. And though we shouldn't sprint as fast as we can all through life, we definitely shouldn't be slowing down as we approach the finish line. Yes, our strength may be diminished because, you know, we've been running for a long, long time. But we still need to give it all we've got as we approach the finish line. It's no time to stop and take a nap or take a rest. It's time to get fully awake and to get moving because time is running out and the end is in sight. We want to be able to say, like Paul at the end of his life in 2 Timothy 4, 7-8, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So folks, the time is urgent, and urgent times require urgent changes. If we've been slumbering and sleeping instead of being focused on pleasing God and serving others, he likens living in this world with living in the night, Some are asleep doing nothing that they should be doing. And others are awake doing all of the things that they shouldn't be doing. And so it's time for both to wake up. Because the the night is coming to an end. The day is almost here. And of course the day is a metaphor for our salvation. It seems likely that many in the church at Rome were asleep to what was going on in their world. And there's no doubt that many Christians today are asleep to what is going on in our world. They're living only for the moment, only for themselves, only to satisfy their goals, their desires, the things that they want to do. And if their goals and their desires are the things God wants, then that's well and good. But so often... There's no thought given to what God desires and to what pleases Him. I'm telling you, that's a life that might bring some temporary pleasure and satisfaction, but it will only be temporary. And quite often, it'll be very short-lived. And it'll leave you empty and despairing, and you'll soon be moaning like that old Rolling Stones song, I can't get no satisfaction. And so the New King James Version says, knowing the time, that it's high time. The NIV says, understanding the present time, the hour has already come. And the New Living Translation says, for you know how late it is, time is running out. We must wake up to our eternal salvation being nearer than it's ever been. And so we must start making adjustments now so that we won't be caught unprepared. So what should those adjustments be? Well, with night coming to an end, we must first of all remove our dark deeds. We see this in uh, the end of verse 12 and the end of verse 13 and the end of verse 14. So let me just read those sections of those verses to us. Romans 13, 12 Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Then verse 13, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. And then the last part of verse 14, and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Paul first talks generally here. He says to cast off the works of darkness. He talks about putting off and putting on in the book of Ephesians and also the book of Colossians. It's really the same thing here, except he says to cast off the works of darkness and to put on the armor of light. In Romans, Ephesians, and Colossians, it's really the same Greek words. So cast off or put off and then put on. Then he gives us a list of the things to cast off 
if we haven't already done so. Some of these are public sins. Some are private sins. Some could be both. He talks about revelry and carousing. The word here can also be translated rioting. We've sure seen a lot of this this last year in places like Seattle and Portland on our side of the country uh, and in Washington, D.C. and in a lot of other places around the country. Wherever it is, whatever the cause, Paul says you're supposed to stay away from that stuff. Stay away from the rioting. Peaceful protests are one thing, but when they turn to riots, that's when the Christian should split and refuse to be part of it. Drunkenness can be either a public or a private sin. It doesn't matter where you're drunk. Paul calls it a work of darkness. He says, cast it off. Then he talks about lewdness and lust. There used to be more, these used to be more private than public sins, but now they're both. Lewdness is sexual immorality and is defined basically as anything but the God-ordained sexual relationship between husband and wife. And lust is unbridled lust, no holds barred lust. It's every kind of sexual depravity that can be imagined. And by the way, pornography fits into this category. If you're a Christian and you view pornography on a regular basis, then I can tell you categorically that you are out of the will of God and God will not answer your prayers until you repent and quit. I don't care what anybody says. It's evil and it's a work of darkness. Don't allow yourself to be fooled. If it's sex between anyone or anything other than a husband and a wife, then it's lewdness and it's lust and it's an evil work of darkness. And there is no justification that God will accept. You can't say, oh, but we love each other and we're committed to each other. So surely God accepts us. Well, if you love each other and are committed to each other, then get married. That's that's what a marriage is. That's what God says you should do. But know this, God does not accept it. And as long as you engage in these works of darkness, your relationship with God will be severely hindered until you confess and repent of it. Then he talks about strife and envy. Strife is talking about the person who is always contentious. They always want to quarrel and argue with others. And this often comes from being so self-centered that they never seem to have enough attention, enough recognition or position or authority. And they're constantly in competition with others for this. And so they're frequently putting others down, ignoring others, holding others back, and blaming others for whatever problem exists. And when things go wrong, it's always someone else's fault. Then envy. Envy is a jealousy that begrudges others and wants what they have. It hates the success of others. Paul says these things are works of evil and works of darkness. So with the night coming to an end... Paul says, we must remove the deeds of darkness. Finally, Paul says, with day dawning on us, we must walk as children of light and children of the day. Romans 13, 12, the latter part of the verse says, and let us put on the armor of light. Then the first part of verse 13, let us walk properly as in the day. And finally, the Uh, beginning part of verse 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He says to put on the armor of light. What is the armor of light? Well, the first thing that we can deduce from the phrase is that it is something that protects us. It's armor, and it protects us from attack. Where else does Paul talk about armor? Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 16. He says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And almost for sure, the armor of light is the armor of God. And how does this help us? 
Well, it helps us to withstand in the evil day, Paul says, and to stand. What does this mean? What does this mean to withstand? Well, it means to resist. It means to oppose. Sounds like a really good thing, doesn't it? When we're being attacked on all sides with evil, don't we want to be able to resist and withstand so that we don't suffer defeat? Do you want to be defeated? Hey, I don't. So we really need this armor, don't we? What is it? And how do we get it? Well, Ephesians 14, uh, 6, uh, verses 14 to 18 give us the details. But let me summarize it for us. It's truth, it's righteousness, it's readiness, it's faith, it's salvation, it's the word of God, and it's prayer. That's what it is. How do I get it? It's simple. You turn to God in repentance and faith, and he gives it to you wherever you need it as you call out to him. That's how you put on the armor of light. If you keep that armor on, you'll always walk in the light and never in darkness. And he says in verse 13, let us walk properly as in the day. What does that mean? It means to want what God wants for us. It means to be in complete surrender to him, telling him we only want to do what he wants us to do. That's what walking properly in the day is. Are you completely surrendered to the will of God in your life? You know what? We don't need to make big, long lists of all of the things that we should be doing to please the Lord. If we'll make our focus walking in love, then we will be doing all the other things that we should be doing. And we'll be avoiding all the other things that we should be avoiding. Again, verse 10, Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. That's clear enough, isn't it? And finally, he says in verse 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, these are the last days. It's important that we be awakened to that fact, that we cast off the works of darkness and we put on the armor of light, and that we begin to live and to walk after the Spirit, making no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. That means you go home and you get rid of everything that is causing you to stumble into these works of darkness. First you repent of them. Then you ask God to give you the strength and the wisdom to overcome them. If you have a problem with alcohol, you go home and you get rid of it. You go and you stay away from places that serve it. If you have a problem with uh, lust and pornography, you confess it to somebody who will hold you accountable. And you put a block on your internet and your computer and your phone and you give somebody else the password and the permission to check and see if you've been faithful. You destroy the books and the magazines that promote it. You make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Instead, we walk in purity, we walk in holiness, we walk in righteousness, we walk in truth, because Jesus could come before church is out today. We want to be found in him. We want to be found in that righteousness which is of Christ. We want to be found walking in the Spirit. In one of the daily, our daily bread uh, devotionals back in February of 2019, I read about an author. Uh, I read about author Ernest Hemingway. He was asked if he could write a compelling story in just six words. This was his response. For sale, baby shoes never worn. You say, why is that so compelling? Well, it's compelling because you're not quite sure what to make of it. Because so little is said, you're inspired to sort of, uh, your imagination to sort of want to fill in the details. Were those shoes unused because 
a healthy child didn't like them? Or were they lost after they were purchased and then found after the child had grown so, so big that they couldn't wear them anymore? Or were they a gift and they didn't go with anything the child had? Or was there a tragic loss wherein the child died before the shoes could be worn? And if so, what were the circumstances of the child's death? And what were the stories of all the people who lived through such a trying time? Dad and mom, brother and sister, grandpa, grandma. Isn't it true that the best stories just get your mind running in all kinds of directions? So that when you get to the end of the chapter, you, you just want to keep reading on because you've just got to find out what happens next. And isn't it true that the story of salvation does something similar? God created all things for his and for our enjoyment. But mankind sinned against God and essentially ruined what could have been a beautiful relationship. So did God just leave it that way? No, he didn't. He sent his son to the earth and his son died for our sins and rose again from the dead so that we could be saved from the penalty of our sins and be united in our relationship with God. And now we patiently wait for him to return and to restore things to what they should have been all along. Now, folks, that's a compelling story. And how will that story be played out in each of us? How should it be played out? In each of us. What should our response be to what God has already done? If Jesus is going to return and deal with the problem of evil forever, then shouldn't we want to cast off the works of darkness in our own lives and put on the armor of light, loving him and loving others in a way we never have before? How we do this may be different with each of us and the ones we minister to, but as we seek God and as we seek out the wounded and the weeping, God will guide us and he will equip us to bring his justice, his love, his comfort to a world that needs it. Folks, this is what our lives should be all about. Yes, this is what living while time is running out should look like. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the way your spirit speaks to our hearts when we're open to you and when we seek your will for our lives. Speak to us today in those very specific areas of our lives that this applies to. Help us to identify the works of darkness that we've been engaging in and to repent of them. And help us, Lord, to put on the armor of light so that we can be protected in this evil day as the darkness comes to an end and as Jesus Christ gets ready to return and to set up his kingdom. We thank you for it, Lord. Help us today to serve you with all of our hearts with every ounce of energy that we have. In Jesus' name, amen.